Well, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the start of our webinar. I am Justin Matsuhara, forensic analyst and instructor with Black Bag Technologies. Joining me today is Drew Fahey, our Vice President of Product Development. This morning we're going to discuss Blacklight and the recent changes. Drew will be, taking, will be talking about and demonstrating some of the new cool features we offer. Blacklight is our computer and mobile device forensic software. It is obviously capable of analyzing not only Windows and Mac, but also Android and Apple iOS devices. The nice thing about this tool is you have the ability to bring in all those devices under one file, allowing you to compare data across um, the devices. It works on either Windows or Mac platforms and supports EO1. Uh, the DD-RAW, SMART, VMDK, Forensic Images. As you will see, the tool's user interface is extremely easy to navigate. Drew's team of developers do a great job with bringing the data to the forefront so you as an investigator don't have to, you know, to, you don't have to dig to find that critical piece of evidence. You know, we've all been there where you, you're just constantly digging around and you just can't find it. But Drew's team did a great job on that interface so that it's right there for you to see. While Drew is demonstrating the newest features, you will have an opportunity to ask questions. But to do so, type in your question in the question box, which is about two thirds down the GoToWebinar screen. At the very end of the demonstration, Drew and I will address the questions you have. So without further ado, uh, welcome Drew Fahey. Thanks, Justin. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome, uh, fellow forensicators. Uh, most of you may may know me. I've been around the uh, the forensics world for some time. I'm very happy to uh, present what we've uh, put together for uh, this year for Blacklight 2016 R2. Uh, I'm going to be running through a whole bunch of different um, items that we've created for new features in Blacklight. I'm also going to talk about some of the behind the scenes things that we've done. Um, that aren't obviously as sexy as the new user interfaces and things like that. Um, and, and I'll spend some time talking about that. But I really would like to spend a lot of time um, at the end also, like Justin just said, answering any questions that you guys may have. Um, I may even give you guys some preview into some of the up and coming features that uh, we're going to be addressing with future releases. Uh, so. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and kick this off and uh, give you a demonstration of Blacklight 2016 R2. All right. All right, so what you should see here is Blacklight's interface. This would look very similar to those who've been running uh, 2016 R1 for some time. Um, and there really has been no difference in this particular uh, UI window. Sorry about that. And what I do want to show though is one of the problems that we've, we've had, and it's completely understandable, is in previous versions of Blacklight, we had the Add Evidence uh, button within the user interface there as well as the file menu to add evidence. One of the problems with that though that we've noticed was that we had kind of an overabundance of menu options and it was confusing to many users um, and, and, and rightfully so in the sense that if you had say an encrypted iOS image that came from a product say Cellbrite or if you had just an iOS backup or if you had a disk image um, we throw a lot around the terms like image and whatnot, and that can be very confusing to, to people, especially new forensic people who come in and they've only been doing the job for, for three months or so. So one of the things that we really wanted to do was hopefully try to simplify that interface of bringing in and ingesting um, evidence. So one of the things that we've done is created a whole new um, ingestion interface for that purpose. Now, 
as before, there's still multiple ways you can bring evidence into Blacklight, regardless if you're running it on Windows or running it on Mac like I am right now. You can simply drag and drop items into your evidence window. Um, you can click on the Add button. Both of them will bring up the same window. So, for example, if I wanted to bring in um, a, an image or if I wanted to bring in a raw PST file, uh, which we'll talk about later when we talk about email, or if we wanted to bring in memory dump or uh, a single file or a Celebrite uh, image of, of an iOS or an Android device, it really doesn't matter. So uh, you could take that image, you just drag and drop it onto the window, and it will open up the new evidence ingestion window. The other way to bring this in is to click on the Add button, and it will do the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> what we'll do is we will remember any of the evidence items that you've already added. Uh, and one of the biggest differences we have in this, in this user interface here is the fact that um, before, on previous versions of Blacklight, it was kind of an all or nothing approach. So you could only add one piece of evidence, choose your options, and then go. And if you wanted to bring in another piece of evidence, you would have to basically go through that whole process all over again. This new ingestion window allows you to bring in multiple pieces of evidence all at the same time, all with different options. So as an example, um, I, I currently have three different disk drives attached. So this is the, the drive that, I'm, that Blacklight is running on. These are two different attached external devices. I can, I can click on any of these and I can actually bring these in if I wanted to bring in that drive itself. Uh, this is the image that I dragged and dropped onto the Blacklight window and it automatically detected the partitions that make up that particular image. And you can see <clears throat> there, there are two automatically selected partitions. Uh, these are the partitions that we recognize and say there's going to be potentially more data on there so they're automatically checked. Um, and then over on the right are the ingestion options. Now you can globally set those so if I have my, my CFREDS, which just happens to be a, a, a typical forensic test image suite, um, I uploaded that into, into our evidence window here, and I can choose as, at a global level the options that I want. So by default, our triage option is set, which basically means it's going to do the file signature analysis as well as calculate MD5 hashes, as you can see when I open up the window and it will calculate that based on everything that's checked. Well, if I wanted to change those options for the individual partitions, I could do that. So, for example, if I wanted to set uh, NTFS here and I wanted to add SHA-1 hashes, I could do that. Um, if I actually wanted to do picture analysis on this particular image but not this one, I could do that as well. If I chose not to even bring in this partition for whatever reason, I, I could do that. Um, so you, you, and it will remember all of the states. So if I also wanted to bring in another piece of evidence, so let's say for example I want to bring in this raw file, this happens to be PST emails, I can drop that in and now I can do again my own ingestion options just on that one single file. So one of the other differences that you'll notice very uh, quickly for those of you who've been using Blacklight for a while is before if we wanted to bring in a single file we forced you to put that file into a folder and then to bring the folder in. Um, we've made a change within the framework that now allows you, you can bring in a single file uh, and it will be treated just like a file. You no longer have to put it into it, its own folder. Um, so for, I'll just let this run. Um, as you can see, I'm bringing in a PST file. I actually want to do uh, some advanced options on there. I actually want to parse it as email. Uh, email is uh, one of our, it's a non-default option and that's because a lot of people um, don't necessarily want email for particular investigations. Um, so it's just it's an option that you'd have to choose under the advanced system files so you can actually see that mail parsing is, is one of those options. Uh, so for that particular one, I, I do want to choose email so it will actually parse the email and, and provide it within the user interface when we're ready to actually look at that. Uh, one of the other options you notice under the advanced option window uh, when I open it is calculating entropy. I have something new. Um, a lot of our Investigators that are looking, obviously, for encrypted files want to basically, you know, have a quick glance at that. They can they can choose the entropy option and it will calculate that on every file that's not zero bytes. 
uh, in size. <clears throat> and all the other options that you notice there, um, most of those have not changed. Uh, we have kind of refactored them and improved upon them. Uh, specifically with the file carving, we're, we're consistently and, and constantly uh, improving our file carving options uh, for, for files. Um, hashes hasn't changed as well as a picture of video analysis. So you can choose the options that you want. Um, again, we still have the templates that we've had in the past, uh, and so you can actually see each one is, is slightly different. And so we'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll just start that, and it will bring them in. And so as you can see as before, we have our evidence status window that tells us what's going on, which, which particular um, item it's currently working on with parsing and whatnot. You can see that here. Um, so that's really the new ingestion window. Now, and, and again, as a recap, the biggest thing that we have with that is behind the scenes, it, will, it should automatically detect um, items. So for example, if you do bring in an encrypted iOS image, it will identify, hey, this is an, this is an encrypted iOS image. Um, and as such, you'll see a lock icon. For example, what I did with, with this Josh Bennett phone, uh, and I can actually show you an example of that when I go to uh, when I go to the racer partition and I go to the actual uh, intelligence view and, and I want to see all of the say the device backups so these these happen to be all of the, the backups that are within this image file and I can import any one of these that, that I want to uh, so for example with this iPhone 5 uh, this is the one that I brought in uh, this one was encrypted and so when I try to uh, bring that back in to, uh, to Blacklight, it, it'll, it has to export it, it'll import it. When it does that, it's going to tell you that the, uh, that particular image is encrypted and it'll give you the option to decrypt it. Now Blacklight does not do the forced decryption uh, on anything. You will still have to know the appropriate credentials in order to unlock that particular device. So as you can see here, um, there's a lock icon. So and it, it tell, if you hover over it, it'll tell you, hey, it's encrypted, and this is going to be true for all different types of images that we automatically detect. You can click on that um, lock icon, and it will, it will pull up a, uh, a new window that will show you uh, the ability to enter your, your password, uh, if, assuming you have it. Again, just to stress, uh, Blacklight does not currently uh, brute force any of these uh, encrypted passwords. So uh, you, you will have to know it in order to ingest it, you know, and to, excuse me, to ingest it. And, that's, and so one of the things about these, the new ingestion window is the fact that it kind of has some smarts behind it. Uh, hopefully we're not, we're not too smart and make it more difficult, but it, uh, it will automatically do that stuff behind, for you. So you don't have to go in there and choose the appropriate uh, type anymore. It should do that for you. Um, so that's, that's kind of really the new ingestion window and again as a recap, each partition can, can have its own processing options. There's a lot of uh, advanced options that you can choose for each one. Uh, I, will, I will stress that you know, we've tested this against some large partitions, especially, uh, um, not partitions, large images, especially images like Windows images that have you know, multiple uh, volume shadow copies and I will just you know, say that if you load up your ingestion window with um, five or six images and you're trying to process each image and each image contains you know five or six volume shadow copies you're going to really tax your system um, and so it, 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 it could be uh, it, it could be an interesting case of, of a lot of wait and see what happens um, that said what I am going to, what I will tell you is uh, we were a little delayed in getting this release out when we wanted to, but the reason for that is because we started looking at um, some of the processing issues that were going on behind the scenes in, in ingesting the evidence, uh, and we actually found areas that uh, we were able to dramatically improve. Um, to give you an idea of dramatic improvement in some of our test case scenarios, um, where it was literally taking four days to process, uh, in some instances with all processing options chosen, we have actually got that down to about four hours. Now that, that is ex extremely significant uh, in in fixing a lot of those issues, um, which is great. Uh, but what what actually showed that problem was with this new ingestion window and loading up Blacklight with a whole bunch of different um, 
processes and options that could be chosen. And so that was one of the things that it kind of magnified a problem that we have. But we went back and, and make sure we, we delayed the release to actually fix that. And so we're pretty happy with, with our performance that we're, we're running on now. Uh, and later on, if we get time, I'll talk about some of the, the future updates that we're kind of planning for even more performance enhancements. Um, so along with the ingestion window, <coughs> you, you get the benefit of having uh, an extreme performance boost, if you will. So that's, that's all we have with the ingestion window. <laughs> One of the other things um, that we like to pride ourselves here at Black Bag is we, we, we really try to listen to our end users as far as you know, what makes their life and their day-to-day -day job uh, as easy and pain-free as possible. Uh, and one of the things that has been a, an ongoing request for some time, it's not that we've ignored you, we've actually tried to put some things in place and it was a little helpful, um, but kind of went back to the drawing board to look at it because more and more people were asking for it. Um, and it makes sense, especially with people who have multiple monitors, was the ability to actually do um, breakout windows within the user interface. And so uh, we, we incorporated that, although we did do it um, a little bit differently. You know, we don't have every single window have the ability to break out. Uh, but as we started talking to users, uh, what, we, what we really found out was that, well, most people just really want to break out um, one or two extra windows so they can actually put one window on, on one monitor for like scanning through images and they have another window on another monitor where they can see other data. And so what we, uh, what we came down to, as I'll show you on this racer partition, uh, if I go to a file filter and I want to list, um, we can just do user created images as an example on this partition. So one of the things that we did is we took our file content view, which is this lower bar right here, and we made that have the ability to actually break it out into its own pane. Uh, so this would be a typical example of what users may do in a real case. Um, you know, we've already done this behind the scenes for you where we've calculated all of the system hashes against this partition and now we're saying show me all of the images that a user had the potential to make. So that means these are not ones that come native with the operating system. Um, it could be that they're images that come from third-party apps, unless those are in your, your hash sets that you're ignoring. Uh, but in this case, this is just as one of our filters. So I'm actually going to close what you guys are used to seeing as the file content view because I want to maximize my list. So this may be the one window I have on one monitor. And now what I can do is I can break out those panes. So if you look at the hash marks right here that are on the file content window, if I just drag those out, it's going to open up its own file content view for whatever I selected. So no image or no item within that image is selected yet, so it is going to be blank. Now, we don't limit you, so you can create as many of these as you really want to. Um, right for this purpose, I'll just do um, two or three, and you, you'll be able to actually see these. I'll just resize this one. And so now, once I start clicking on a file, you'll notice that file content views will start updating. So I'll just pick one of these images that are named by a date stamp, which are typically means that they were, uh, in this case, I just happen to know this is images that were taken with the phone. So when I start clicking on it, the very first tab is all open. So our hex view, so you can actually see um, there's some exit data here. So this is in fact, you know, a JPEG file. I can go to metadata on one view so I can see all the files metadata. Uh, over here, we can do a preview. So if I start clicking down, uh, maybe I'll open another window here and I'll say, you know, what if there's location data on some of these? Uh, and so you'll notice that they'll all stay in front. So for each time I choose a file, you're going to see that it updates within those breakout panes. Um, and again, we don't limit you, so you can break out as many of these as you want. Obviously, it only makes sense here for, for this that we have three panes. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, three, uh, six panes and one for each of the tabs that we have in here. Uh, so, you know, six would be a maximum that I would probably ever do. And, and so that's what we, we've done. Now, the great thing about um, the way I feel that we've done this is in, in other software we've used, um, and not, not just forensic software, but even things like, say, Photoshop, one of the problems with the breakout windows um, users generally have is resetting them. So you either have to go to a file menu and say, hey, reset the view the way I want it, 
um, or you have to sit there and you have to drag and, and drop that window just into the precise area. And if you don't get it in the right area, it just doesn't work. So rather than doing that, we opted to say, you know what, we're not even going to do that. It just if you don't want these windows anymore, you just simply close them. Uh, they go away and it's there. Uh, and as always, the file content view still exists. So you can just drag this window up and you will always have that one in place. Uh, and you can still break out another one if you want. So that's what we did. We called the file content view a breakout uh, window and it, it worked really, really well. And, and again, it, this will work identically on Windows as it does if, as if you're running on Mac like I am today. So one of the other things that um, people have been asking for for some time um, and it was a high crowdsource value, basically meaning that a lot of our customers were asking for it, uh, and we have we've implemented it within this release. Is the ability to do multi-column sorting, uh, and there's obviously uh, several cases where this can become uh, very handy. So, as an example, just in this view that I have right here, showing all of the you know user what we're calling user created images. Uh, there, there could be multiple image types here. There, you know, and as you can see, I already have. There's some JPEG. There's PNG. If I scroll down through this list, there's, you're probably going to find TIFF files um, and whatever else. So, if I wanted to sort these by the extension type, um, our content extension, and basically, as a, as a reiteration, content extension means we've analyzed the file type and based on the header information of that file, so as an example, I go to the hex view, based on the header information, we know that this is in fact a JPEG file. So if I were to take um, this particular list and do, just click on the column header where it filters and I'm sorting uh, in an in ascending order all of my content extensions. So you can see I have BMPs here, GIFs, JPEGs are going to be below that, um, PNGs and so forth. Uh, well, there, we, up until this version, we've never had the ability to sort within that sort, and now we can. So I can actually now sort, so if I, if I sort based on content extension, and now I can sort based on when the date was created, um, or a size. So if I hold the shift key down and I say click on size, um, you'll now see that we have a double hash there. And so now you can see right away, if I just resort this one, um, based on the BMPs, I can now have it with the largest verse, you know, in a, in a descending order, and I can do that. And you can do that within any of the views uh, within Blacklight. So uh, I know that was, you know, something that's been asked for for some time. I'm very happy to finally bring that to you. Uh, in addition to multi-column sorting, one of the things that people have been asking for for, for some time is the ability to reorder these columns. Uh, and and we've, we've done that as well. Now that's, that's basically through as, as uh, is conducted through a view manager, so you can actually um, adjust the columns. And when you adjust the columns, you'll get a, a window here, and you simply just drag and drop what you want. So if you want the MD5 next to the name, um, so you can actually see the name and then the MD5 path if you want, you apply the changes, uh, and the columns will now actually shift for you. So that also happens um, basically in all of the views that, that provide a list view. So those are the two big things that we're pretty happy with um, with 2016 R2 to, to, to provide to you, things that have been you guys have been asking for for some time. And, uh, and on the surface, it seems like it should be easy. Um, unfortunately, sometimes it, it, it's not quite that easy. Like, uh, for example, it would be real nice to be able to drag and drop these. That's something that we're still looking into to see what we can do to, to provide that. But uh, this is definitely a, uh, a great way to do it, and, and it will remember it. So once you close your case and reopen it, uh, it, it will remember that, hey, I wanted MD5 next to my name, and, and it will stay that way for all your cases. So that's the multi-column sorting and then the multi-column shifting. So one of, the, one of the next things I'm going to talk about, which we're extremely happy for, uh, it's been a long time coming. This is something that I've been wanting to get to for, for a while now. Um, and that is the ability uh, for offline maps. So one of the problems that we've had in the past, and, and many of you will remember this, is uh, the on previous versions, I'm just going to pull up, because uh, I don't have, I don't keep old black light versions uh, around on this particular system. 
But if you remember on previous versions of Blacklight, when you had a location data um, item, this is what you would see. So you'd go to location view or you'd go to um, the location tab in the file content view and you would have this Mercator map which for all intents and purposes is okay. I mean you can see that hey this image is probably somewhere in California, definitely in the United States. Uh, but if you're in a country say the Netherlands, um, you know that red cross basically covers the entire country so it really doesn't do you any good. Um, and it, it's Yes, you could go to Google Maps and, and get a much more detailed view, but that would assume that you're on an internet connected system, um, which you know a lot of our law enforcement agencies are not necessarily connected to the internet in, in some cases. So we created the ability, so when you go to download Blacklight, make sure you download, um, there's a couple of additional resources. We want to make sure you download the offline maps, because now when you have location-based data, in the easiest way, I'll just go to location view. So all of these are location-based data, uh, which basically means they're going to have geolocation in them, and we should be able to plot those out on a map. Uh, so now, when you install the offline map view, this is what you're going to see. So this is all done offline. You don't need to be connected to the Internet at all. Uh, we've generated our own maps based on open street maps, uh, and what will happen is they will default to three different zoom levels. Uh, so in the upper left hand corner where you see the United States, um, that's a zoom level of three. And then right below that you'll have a zoom level of five. And then to the right of that is a zoom level of, uh, uh, level of eight. Uh, so what this means is regardless of wherever you're at in the world, um, you will have those three different zoom levels. So here's Europe. You can actually get an idea. So this is going to give you a much better indication of where a person was at. Um, we do have the ability, if you want actually a higher zoom level, you can even do that and add that to Blacklight. Uh, by default, when you install the offline maps, we, we install zoom levels 0 through 8 using OpenStreetMaps. Um, by all means, if you want to generate your own zoom levels, um, you know, up to 14 or 15 if you wanted to go that high, you could definitively do that, add those um, tiles to Blacklight. Um, and basically you'll be able to proceed. So just to kind of give you an example, I'm going to take this uh, image file that uh, I, I just got this morning, uh, just a JPEG some, you know, someone at the office took. I'm going to add it in. Uh, I'm going to go ahead. I don't even need to. I, I can process the pictures. It's one file. It's going to be real quick. Uh, I just click on start and give you an idea of, of what I mean. I've actually incorporated um, some higher level zoom levels for our areas that, you know, obviously Black Bags headquartered in San Jose. This image was taken in San Jose. So when I go there uh, and, I, and I look, you can actually see the much higher level zoom level that we have. Um, so now I can definitively say not only that he's in San Jose, but what street they're at. And this happens to be, you know, where, where Black Bag headquarters is. So um, gives you gives you a pretty good indication of what you can do. And all of this again is done offline, so you do not need to have an internet connection in order to see these. Um, in addition, if I tag this file uh, and I want to incorporate it in my report, this is the image that you will see in your report. Um, one of the reasons uh, this particular iteration did not have zoom level features, meaning allow you to zoom in and out, was because that makes it very difficult when we're trying to say, hey, we want to put it in a report and, and ask you the zoom levels. I will, I will preface that by saying that that is something that we're, we are going to be working on. It's on a long-term roadmap to actually give you even more features and ability uh, with mapping and zoom levels and how that all goes into the report. So be patient with us. That, that stuff is definitely coming, but we think that this is, a, uh, this is definitely a win-win feature for everyone because you'll be able to see pretty much where, where people are at when they're taking pictures with location data. Okay, so one of the uh, other things that we did is we spent a, a lot of time um, working on email in this particular release. Uh, initially, it wasn't our intention, but we got a lot of feedback me, um, that email is still of, of importance uh, to a lot of the, the uh, forensics investigators. Um, so we wanted to kind of go back, take a look at what we were offering, and we revamped um, a lot of the uh, the email views that we had. So 
the first thing is we change the view. So if I just go to registers view and I go to communication and I move the window again, um, sorry about that. And if I go to communication and choose email, you'll notice that our email view um, has been changed around kind of significantly and cleaned up. Um, so I can actually see in this case, this is all of Josh's email. Uh, I can see his different e email inboxes that he had. So if I happen to go to an inbox, here's all the email that you'll, you'll notice. Um, so this is very similar to was it, the way it was before. Uh, I'm just going to sort um, on the, uh, the attachment counts here. Uh, so you actually see the attachments. So one of the things that uh, we've done a little bit differently now is you'll see that these, these tabs here. Actually, I think it's this one. So the reason why those emails weren't, weren't displaying is those were actually um, uh, encoded emails, and we aren't decoding the, that particular one. But if you go through the emails, you'll see in the email tab, we try to give it to you in a view that the user would have seen. Um, so most of the emails will render this way. This is basically kind of what we'll call the user view, if you will. Uh, so the very basic header information and, how the, uh, and then what the email looks like. If you go to the properties, you'll get pretty much all of the header information that uh, we can display to you for that email. Um, obviously, there is the raw source. And then on the attachments, you'll see a list of the attachments. If you click on that and then go to the preview, you can actually see now in line what the attachment was. Uh, so this, you know, big departure from the way it was before. You actually had to export that attachment, uh, bring it back into Blacklight and see what it, what it was, uh, if you could even view it. So you can, again, tagging will work the same way. If you tag the whole email and it has attachments, you will get the option. Uh, so for example, if I want to say tag this email as a new tag, uh, I'm going to get the options for the attachment. Uh, and I click in here and everything that I've checked will actually be in, in the actual tag. So um, you know, whatever, you, when you, whatever you have will be in that tag and will then obviously go into your report. Uh, so the other thing, though, is in addition to changing the, the UI and, and, and making it a little bit better and easier to navigate for email, we uh, spent quite a bit of time in actually being able to do Outlook-based uh, email parsing. So that is inclusive of the, the PST format as well as the OST format for Microsoft Outlook, uh, and that's Outlook for both Mac and Windows. Um, there's, there's differences between the two, unfortunately. Um, but that said, we will parse both. Uh, currently in 2016 R2, I will, I will just iterate that there's a caveat to that in that we will parse basically all the versions of Outlook that uh, we know of for Windows. Um, however, for the Mac side of Outlook, we, we will currently only parse the 2016 version of Outlook. Um, the, the older version, we're um, we were going to we're going to go back to and we'll actually have that working in, in another iteration of Blacklight. Um, but so currently the, the the current version on on Mac is supported on Windows. All versions are supported. Uh, and so you see, I brought in just a single file PST. Uh, if I bring in this, this happens to just be one of the Enron examples that's freely available for testing uh, online. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's that's why I'm showing you this. Um, so as you can see, um, this happens to be one example. Um, and on any of these, uh, you can actually see uh, any of the any of the data the same way. So, for example, this Four Seasons doc preview. Here's a doc for uh, an actual Word doc from that that give you the preview. So, uh, Outlook is going to work the exact same way um, as all the other email formats that we currently support, uh, which which is what we're pretty happy with. So, those are the kind of the major. Um, overall changes within the user interface um, that, that you'll, you'll recognize right off the bat. Uh, most of the other things uh, within the user interface have, have pretty much stayed the same within this particular release. Uh, we have gone back and we've tried to make sure things are, are the same throughout all of the views. So that means you know, all of these list views, regardless if you're an email, uh, if you come down to the phone and you go to the calls view, uh, all of these list views should basically work and function the same way. So we've spent some time going through making sure those are all the same <clears throat> regardless of the view that you're in. Um, and again, so the, the, main, the main points we talked about for UI changes was the ingestion window, 
the file content viewer um, changes and how you can break those panes out, the multi-column sorting, multi-column shifting, the offline maps and the email. So those were the big major changes we did for the user interface in this particular release. <clears throat> so now that said, behind the scenes, um, there were some, some major improvements uh, in, in how we do certain things. Um, so for example, in addition to the hashing, obviously we did the, the entropy calculation um, and give you an idea, you know, for, for entropy calculation, um, it's, it's very simple. Uh, it's all based on, on Shannon's uh, entropy uh, calculation. Um, it's, it's pretty basic. So you're basically going to have uh, an entropy level basically 0 through 1. Uh, so if you have something that's 0.99 or 1.0, that's extremely high uh, in an entropy value. So that basically is going to be, you know, highly compressed data. For example, in this case, movie files. Um, it could be encrypted zip files, things like that. If you have an entropy value, less than five, you know, if you're talking about a three or a four, um, those are probably not as um, highly compressed or highly structured. So things like plists, you know, are, are a good example. Uh, so that's kind of basically how the entropy calculation works. Uh, you can calculate entropy on any file as long as it's zero bytes, uh, as long as it's not zero bytes, uh, and, and you'll get a value. And so that's kind of how the, the entropy calculation works. <clears throat> One of the other things, um, that we've spent some time working on and, and kind of important uh, for, for everyone here uh, and everyone using Blacklight was we were using an open source library uh, for reading uh, EO1 files. Uh, we have since changed that. Uh, we now have our own internal um, code for basically reading and parsing EO1 L1 files. Uh, in addition, one of the advantages of that is we will actually support EXO1s now. Um, in, in the future, we're going to be even adding more uh, additional support to that. Um, and and th that, that's just information that will come out later, but we're going to have even more support for EO1 format than what we do now. Uh, basically, you can, you can surmise that uh, what I'm talking about is, is the ability to write out EO1s. Um, that is on our, on our roadmap, and so we'll have that kind of capability as well. Uh, so there was a huge improvement with, with the EO1 capability and the LO1 capability with 2016 R2 in the sense that um, basically it's, it's, it's a lot more robust uh, with the code that we wrote. Uh, so you, you won't have some of the memory errors. So if you have highly um, segmented EO1 images, you know, we, there were problems in the past with Blacklight and dealing with those. Uh, those issues are now all resolved with our new EO1 reader. So I think a big improvement there. Uh, in addition, one of the things, and unfortunately, I'm not uh, a big Android guy, but uh, we, we do offer uh, Android support in Blacklight. We have for, for some time in addition to Mobilize. Uh, and we, we released Mobilize earlier this year with support for Marshmallow. Uh, that same support is now built into Blacklight 2016 R2. So for those of you that have, um, you know, are getting in a lot of Android devices uh, that are running uh, Marshmallow, you now have that support within Blacklight, which is which is a great thing. Uh, we did improve and update our drivers. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the crazy things about mobile devices is is dealing with all of the different disparate uh, devices out there and how they all require you know in some cases fringe drivers. So we we try to do the best that we can with validating drivers on all of the systems and and the products that we have that we have for testing. Um, so sometimes, unfortunately, that does fail and that you, you'll get a device that just, hey, there's no driver for it. And so you, you kind of have to go out and, unfortunately, try and find that and, and make it work. So we're, we're trying to make that process easier for everyone uh, and just bear with us because that is definitely a work in progress. But uh, we do fully support Android Marshmallow in this release, which is definitely a good thing. Um, and then, as I said before, uh, we had kind of a massive improvement in our Windows parsing um, time. So for those of you that have been running Blacklight on Windows um, and were comparing it against running Blacklight on Mac, you will have noticed um, that there were, there were very kind of big disparities between the two and that we, you know, we were spending a lot of time <coughs> um, working on Mac and, and making Mac the most efficient and Windows was kind of a, 
uh, I, you, you all felt it was probably kind of a, well, it, it's kind of the redheaded stepchild. And, and, and we, we feel that pain. Uh, we felt your, and heard your calls about that. So uh, we, we made it incumbent that we're making sure that, because we know the majority of you are actually probably running on Windows platforms. Uh, so we kind of turn things around and make sure that we are, we're trying to be as efficient as possible on Windows, uh, not just Mac. And so we spent a lot of time um, analyzing uh, the data calls we have on our back end, uh, processing options that were happening, what was causing bottlenecks, where that data slowdown was, uh, and have made tremendous improvements in that back end. So for those of you running on Windows, you'll be very happy to see that with 2016 R2, you should notice some very, very significant performance improvements. Um, and so we're, we're real happy about that. We would we, love to hear from you uh, one way or the other on that, um, you know, because obviously it's, it, it's good to know uh, that what we're seeing in, in our own internal testing is the same thing that you guys are seeing. So uh, please try it out and get back to us and let us know if, if you're seeing the same significant improvements that we are because we're, we're really happy with it. Uh, and then the last thing I'll talk about very quickly is memory. Um, we have uh, tried to go uh, out and, and create one of the best memory parsers that's available. Uh, and, and we released that a while ago with, with, with the previous versions of Blacklight. We've updated it even more uh, with this release. Uh, in addition to the offline map uh, installer, we now have an, an additional installer for additional memory symbols. So if you grab that, you should. Uh, Blacklight comes default and ships with its own default smaller set of symbols, uh, but if you grab the, the additional symbols pack um, when you're analyzing Windows memory, uh, you shouldn't have any of the issues that, that had, people had experienced in the past. Um, in addition, one of the cool things about uh, memory is that it is, from what I've seen and tested uh, and, and feedback that I've gotten, it's one of the fastest memory processors that um, for getting data out of memory that really exists in any of the tools. So for those of you who are, are doing, say, an incident response type case, um, or for even forensicators who, you know, want to see what people were doing uh, on web, you know, were they going to social media, you know, places and things like that, you can get that kind of information out. I mean, obviously, what you're looking at here is, is the particular processes that were running when that memory dump was made. Uh, and that may in itself may not be super useful to you, but one of the things we also do, and I've had this hidden for a while, is basically pulling out all of the stuff from within that memory image. So as an example, if you want to see any of the internet searches that were done uh, from this memory dump, you can actually see that. So in this case, somebody was looking for car news, looking for BMWs. Obviously, any of you that have taken our BTT class will have seen this. This is one of our Josh Bennett images. Uh, so it is engendered. Um, but it shows you kind of the power of, of what you can get out of memory. Uh, and we've made it really simple for users. Uh, so I will caveat the memory issue by saying that right now we are currently analyzing memory uh, from Windows. Uh, I will tell you, I can't tell you exactly what release it's going to go in and when that's going to happen because you know, obviously we keep that somewhat close hold, but we will be working on um, Mac-based memory analysis, which will provide this kind of the same insight that you see here in Windows. Uh, and there is just one more thing I'd like to point out is unfortunately uh, in the forensics world, as most of you know, we are always playing catch up uh, and, and Windows uh, on Patch Tuesday just released you know, a, a great big update to Windows 10 and unfortunately we've already released R2, <laughs> 2016 R2 for Blacklight uh, and of course the day after, a couple days after we've done that, Windows goes out and they provided an update with Windows 10, which unfortunately does not allow you to do uh, Windows memory analysis with Blacklight. Uh, they, they changed a lot of the internal structures, and so now we got to go look at our code and make sure that those uh, uh, we know where those structures are and, and how it's in place so we can actually parse that. So uh, we're looking at that now, and uh, obviously we'll get an update uh, out as, as soon as we can. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it there. We're going to leave about 15 minutes for some questions and answers. 
Uh, I'll just bring this up in case we need to demo something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this back over to uh, for, to Jesse to kind of go over for any of the questions and answers. Um, but again, if we don't get to all of the uh, questions today, uh, feel free to make sure you uh, you write in. Uh, and one thing I'm going to tell you uh, is is that I, I I love feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, feedback is a gift. Uh, and, and it's hard for us to make any sort of changes without feedback, whether it's positive or negative. Um, so either way, I, I'm, I, you guys have a, a, an open ear with me, so please feel free to give us feedback anytime uh, and as much of it as you can. That would be wonderful. So thank you, and I'll turn this back over to you, Jesse. Thanks, Drew. Um, so we have a couple questions, uh, the first being, does Blacklight have a module where you can apply a decryption key, and this is speaking to corporate computers with full disk encryption. So, my understanding is Macquisition is the acquisition tool in which you, at that point, can apply that de uh, that corporate key to decrypt the data to allow you to create that image with that decrypted data on a corporate computer. Um, Drew, do you have any more on that? Yeah, so you, you're right, Jesse. Um, currently, no, there is not a module for Blacklight to support things like, say, Creedent um, or, or any of the other ones. Um, that said, I, I will tell you that that is another priority item we're getting from customers. Um, so that is something that is on our roadmap. Uh, it will be um, completed uh, in, in the future. Not exactly sure exactly where that's going to be yet. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we, we move things around quite often, but it is definitely something that is on our priority list. Um, but like what Jesse said, is generally, uh, if it's in a corporate account, that means there's generally a master key. So if they have an image, you can mount that image uh, using various tools. Um, acquisition would be an example of one, um, and you can import that master key there to unlock the image and then basically make an unencrypted or make that uh, unencrypted volume available to Blacklight to analyze. Okay. Um, another question was, do you now have the capability to get data from a locked encrypted phone, i.e. a physical or any unlocked tool? Currently, we do not have that capability um, you will be required to have the encryption key or code um, to get the data. That's the unfortunate thing. The way encryption is working now, with especially with the iOS devices, it's very complex. It changes constantly. Um, and even Android, we're starting to see it. Um, so right at this point, we're not, we're not doing any password cracking, per se. Um, so... No to that, unfortunately. Uh, Drew, do you have anything to add to that? Unfortunately, no. I think you pretty much hit, hit the nail on the head. Is the, the encryption stuff is definitely very difficult, um, and you know we don't have anything in place to try to brute force that. Uh, there have been a few. Obviously, I think everybody that that encounters that wants that ability. Um, it's just not simple. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination, so uh, it is something that I, you know, we have requests for. Uh, at some point, it may make it in, but I can tell you that even if it that is on a roadmap, it, it's not. It's definitely not something that's in the short term, just because of the difficulty level involved with, with dealing with that. Great, thank you. Um, next question is: Can we use Blacklight to triage a live computer? There is some processing that occurs when you ingest the image into um, into Blacklight. For live triage, we are actually looking at that. Uh, it was brought up as um, a, a possible enhancement in the future for the ICAC uh, investigators, the guys who do the uh, Crimes Against Children investigators. Uh, to give them the ability to triage a system live. Um, there is a misnomer that with the use of 
an acquisition, you can do it, but um, that is incorrect. So Blacklight is the tool that we, we are focusing on to, to potentially do live triage in the future, but at this point we currently don't have anything out to support that. Uh, anything on that, Drew? I think, you know, I mean, there is, Blacklight does have kind of a way to do it, but it's not in the sense that, um, I think that the, the sense that the, the way the question was worded, um, you can add, like this is the live system right here. So the thing is, is that Blacklight is, is a fairly large piece of installed software. So it's not necessarily, uh, you can run it standalone, so after it's installed, you, you can um, technically put it on a USB key and run it from that. Um, there are certain things that we would need to change in the framework that would better support that. Um, so you, in, in this case, I can basically, um, Blacklight's running, it's running on this Macintosh HD, so I can ingest this live uh, volume if I wanted to, uh, but that's not necessarily what I think the, the point of the question was. And Jesse, you, you, you were exactly right, is that this is something um, that we have been actively pursuing uh, as far as being able to uh, triage any system uh, live and or dead um, within Blacklight so that way you can see the file system uh, being presented without having to have, make a full disk image. Uh, so that is definitely um, a very high priority that uh, that we are looking at. Great, thank you. <clears throat> uh, we have a question regarding how to add higher zoom levels for the maps. Uh, Drew, can you kind of walk them through that if we got the time to do so? It's there's several ways you can do it. Um, I can't give away uh, our, our secrets to the kingdom of how we do it, but I will tell you that uh, it is not super difficult. So uh, if you go to um, OpenStreetMaps, you can, you can basically generate your own uh, zoom level for whatever map area that you want. If you want to do the entire world, uh, you could do that. Um, for example, we have one that we, we don't currently ship with. Uh, we might in the future. Um, we have Zoom level nine, which gives you you know higher, a little bit higher than Zoom level eight. Uh, but if you uh, if you want to go to OpenStreetMaps and or you can even install your own uh, map server, in which case then you can make your own uh, maps and do your own parsing without having to have uh, kind of a wait period. Uh, but if you go to OpenStreetMaps, there's there's all the documentation on there on how to actually generate your own. And when you generate your own, what's going to happen is you're going to get um, PNG tiles. So it's just individual uh, tiles. And so when you install our um, our offline map pack, it's going to create this folder structure under Black Bag Tech OpenStreetMaps, uh, and then there'll be a tiles folder. Now you'll notice that there's nothing in here you'll just add your tiles. So if you happen to have Zoom level nine, you would put those tiles right into this tiles folder. Uh, we actually have uh, our own database of tiles. Uh, there's a reason for that is because when you start generating your own street maps, you're gonna see how very large they get. There's a lot of duplicate files. Uh, and you know, for, for example, Zoom level nine uh, with just the, uh, the PNG, um, tiles, I think those are over a gig in size. Uh, so we, we've, we have our own way of basically taking those same tiles and kind of reducing them and we put them into a single file, which makes it obviously easier to install and makes it a little bit more portable. Uh, but all you have to do if you want to generate your own is basically create or have OpenStreetMaps create those, those PNG tiles for you and then put them in the tiles folder. Blacklight will automatically recognize those and it will use them accordingly. Uh, so, when you have your own street map tiles, you, you notice that um, on this particular one here that I'm showing on the screen, give it a second to update and see it, uh, it automatically updated the zoom level over here to the higher level that we had, which in this case, this one was zoom level 13. Um, and that happened to be that other file that you saw called tiles. 
Um, so if you do download your own, Blacklight will automatically use the highest resolution tile, the highest zoom level tile for this um, big right hand side on, on your location view. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question about uh, does Blacklight support the EX01 format? Uh, we currently support E01 and L01, correct, Drew? 2016R2 does now support um, E01 and EX01. Um, however, if uh, it, it will support both. Uh, but obviously, if the EX01 is is encrypted, if it, you know, actually has the, the, the password in it, um, you'll have to supply that. But it does support both now. All right, and we got two final questions. Um, first part of the question is: as far as showing locations on a map for where photos were taken, can you create a single map with multiple locations to show a path someone traveled? We do have the ability to um, export media that does have uh, geolocations attached to it. And what we have taught in the past, and unfortunately with forensic machines that are typically air-gapped where there's no connectivity to the internet, um, this it wouldn't work all that great, but you have the ability to take the file itself that you export um, and bring it into a a machine that has, let's say, Google Earth on it. So for instance, you can select the pictures of interest, uh, let's say your suspect, you're trying to track that suspect and the pictures that they were taking along their path while they were committing crime, and you know of those being as part of your investigation, you can export those out to a KMZ file. That's inherent to Google Earth, and it gets pushed out to the location of your um, liking, and you would take that over to a machine, let's say if you're, for instance, your machine is air-gapped, take it over to one that has some connectivity to the internet with Google Earth, and you can go ahead and bring it to Google Earth and create a document that in that respect. Um, you can screenshot it and include it, as Drew had showed, the single file to bring in as a document that you can include in with your case file. Um, any, anything more on that, Drew? That's, that's exactly right. We have the ability to do a single KML export for all location data. So you export that file. And the best way is to import that into like a Google Earth. So even if, it, you know, if you're online, put that in there, get that, and then, like you said, bring that out. Um, that said, you know, obviously we do have um, some design plans that, that we've been toying with. Uh, to do something very similar in an offline capacity using the maps that we currently have. Um, obviously to do that, we, you know, we'd have to, there's a lot of uh, behind the scenes that we'd have to do is, you know, figuring out, you know, are we just showing, say, as an example, the United States and the pinpoints on there, or is it the entire world? Um, because if, you know, if you look at the screen, for example, and there's one point right there in, in California and the United States, so if we use that zoom level and pinpointed, you know, say 100 pictures, uh, you, you very quickly see on that particular zoom level it wouldn't be as effective because uh, you can't zoom in. So we have to be able to account for that type of activity on an offline status. So that's something that we would definitely like to get to. Just can't promise you when that's going to happen. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, will Blacklight also work with a new APFS file system? And I will defer that to you, Drew. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and the, probably that I'm, I'm assuming this is probably going to be the last question, but there are some major plans in place. Um, Blacklight is going to be, um, in, in the very near future, going is undergoing some very major changes that will incorporate a lot of new file systems. Um, so I'll just leave it at that, but currently 2016R2 does not currently um, support that. Okay, great. And uh, the final question, I guess, would be how to parse a cell bright dump in Blacklight. Um, with my own dealings, uh, 
trying to bring in Cellbrite, there are a couple things that we have to consider is how it was dumped. Now, I, I tried using it with the UFET touch uh, dumps, and it's unsupported based upon the types of files that are being exported out. Um, we do support physical analyzer um, dumps, and if I'm not mistaken, we have that documented within um, our manual. Is that correct, Drew? All of the Cellebrite, whether you're using physical analyzer and if you're um, using, you know, type one versus type two, you know, they keep changing the way that they do and stuff. But all of that is documented in the user guide. Okay. All right. If we don't have any further questions, um, we're going to. Let me see if I can do this without screwing things up here. All right, I'm back. Okay, this will conclude the webinar. Um, as you can see, there's some contact information there, some up upcoming courses. Please feel free to contact us should you have any questions or further information about the tools that we offer. As you can see with the up upcoming classes, we've got some scheduled out for the rest of the year. Um, the Blacklight Tools training classes, there are two-day training classes on, on, our, on Blacklight. Currently, we keep, they're free and attendees have the opportunity to take the certified Blacklight Examiner test at the very end of the two days. The two courses, the Essentials Forensic Techniques 1 and 2, are week-long, in-depth um, classes dealing with Mac Forensics using Blacklight. There is a cost involved, uh, which is cited on our website, so check our website for further on that. Um, completion of both will give you the ability, or at least prepare you, to, to take the Macintosh and iOS Certified Forensic Examiner Certification Test. Um, you know, we encourage you guys to, to, to look at those classes and attend them if they're available in your area. If not, we, we try to keep as many local as possible, but if obviously travel is an issue and you can fill seats, we can always look at arranging some for you to host the, the training itself. Um, we also offer free trial licenses. They range anywhere from 15 to 30 days. If you're interest, interested in trying out Blacklight, they are complete, full working copies or working licenses. Um, so if you happen to get one, we encourage you, all of you to provide us some feedback on your experience with Blacklight, okay? Uh, our mission is to continually develop the, the, the most powerful forensic tool on the market so you can easily reveal the truth. So thank you all for attending, and to all of our brothers and sisters in law enforcement, please be safe out there. Thank you.